Good afternoon and welcome to A084. With the topic of trauma informed schools for the Louisiana Department of Ed 2020 Teacher Leader Summit virtual series. And if you guys have any questions or comments during the session, you can post them in the chat box. And we will try to address them as we go through the training. I'm going to turn this session over to our two presenters, Dr. Brandy Conrad and Dr. Johanna Bailey. Hello, thank you all for coming and uh, joining us for this session, the Trauma Sensitive School. Um, I'm Dr. Brandy Lamana Conrad and my colleague um, is Dr. Johanna Bailey. Just a quick little background on the two of us. Uh, we are both assistant professors of professional practice at LSU in the School of Social Work. Um, but prior to that, we were both school-based social workers providing mental health counseling to kids in Louisiana in about seven parishes. Um, and so a lot of the students that we saw had experienced some traumatic events. Um, and so we worked with them providing mental health counseling as well as working with the teachers and the parents and families and the schools to try to best meet those kids needs. Um, so we definitely appreciate you coming in today. And if you have any questions, like she said, please let us know. Um, we only have an hour and there's a lot of information to cover. So we might go through things kind of quickly, but please um, you know, stop us if you have any questions. We also have provided our contact information at the end. Um, so if you have any questions or if you're interested in you know, some professional development, um, she and I are more than happy to come to you or do a virtual um, professional development if you want more information on the trauma sensitive school. So before I go through the objectives, I want to start off um, by this quote, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with it or not, but I use this quote often, especially when I'm working with kids who have severe behavior issues or um, those difficult kids that we just don't really know what to do with. Um, the quote says, nine times out of 10, the story behind the misbehavior won't make you angry, it will break your heart. And so when I'm, working with students and I'm trying to figure out what's the best course of action, I always have in the back of my head if they've experienced any trauma. Um, because behavior, there's usually about three top reasons for the functions of behavior. So that would be attention. Um, and we all know that that could be good or bad attention. And sometimes, you know, bad attention is better than no attention at all. Um, tangible activities, things that they're wanting to do or things that they want. Um, and then also escape or avoidance, and that's to get out of doing something or get away from someone. Those, those are usually the reasons behind behavior. Um, so I always try to think if trauma is the reason why a child is behaving the, the way they are. Uh, we learn a lot about, um, you know, contaminated blood and bloodborne pathogens and how we're supposed to, if, you, if a child is bleeding, you know, use gloves and there's precautionary things that you're supposed to do. But I also think that that's how we should look at kids, we should treat every kid as if they've experienced trauma, whether we know about it or not. Um, because trauma is so impactful. And before COVID, uh, we could say that about one in five kids had experienced a traumatic event and that we know now that that number is nowhere near that. Um, intimate partner violence and child abuse has been uh, on the rise since COVID and the stay at home orders. And so now you as the teacher and administration, um, when school resumes, are gonna have these kids who have experienced all of these things um, over the, the course of the stay at home order. So it's very important for us to know um, the things that we are gonna learn today about trauma. So some objectives that we have for today are to identify trauma informed principles we're gonna learn techniques on how to respond to trauma exposed students. And we're gonna increase understanding of what a trauma informed school classroom and teacher looks like. 
So to start off, um, I want to give you kind of a foundation of what trauma is and how trauma impacts the brain. Um, we know that in order to become a trauma sensitive or trauma informed uh, teacher and have that classroom in that school, um, you have to have a foundation of what trauma is. And so this short video, it's about four minutes long, uh, will go over what trauma does to a brain. Um, and I do want to point out that we will use trauma informed and trauma sensitive um, kind of interchangeably. So if you hear us talk about that, that we're, we're talking about the same thing. So here is a, is a quick little video. Science tells us that the experiences we have in the first years of our lives actually affect the physical architecture of the developing brain. This means that brains aren't just born, they're also built over time based on our experiences. Just as a house needs a sturdy foundation to support the walls and roof, a brain needs a good base to support all future development. Positive interactions between young children and their caregivers literally build the architecture of the developing brain. Building a sturdy foundation in the earliest years provides a good base for a lifetime of good mental function and better overall health. So just how is a solid brain foundation built and maintained in a developing child? One way is through what brain experts call serve and return interactions. Imagine a tennis match between a caregiver and a child, but instead of hitting a ball back and forth across a net, various forms of communication pass between the two. From eye contact to touch, from singing to simple games like peekaboo. These interactions repeated throughout a young person's developing years are the bricks that build a healthy foundation for all future development. But another kind of childhood experience shapes brain development too, and that's stress. Good kinds of stress, like meeting new people or studying for a test, are healthy for development because they prepare kids to cope with future challenges. Another kind of stress, called toxic stress, is bad for brain development. If a child is exposed to serious ongoing hardships like abuse and neglect, and he has no other caregiver in his life to provide support, the basic structures of his developing brain may be damaged. Without a sturdy foundation to properly support future development, he is at risk for a lifetime of health problems, development issues, even addiction. It's possible to fix some of the damage of toxic stress later on, but it's easier, more effective, and less expensive to build solid brain architecture in the first place. One of the things that sturdy brain architecture supports is the development of basic emotional and social skills, an important group of skills which scientists call executive function and self-regulation can be thought of like air traffic control in the child's mental airspace. Think of a young child's brain as the control tower at a busy airport. All those planes landing and taking off and all of the support systems on the ground simultaneously demand the controller's attention to avoid a crash. It's the same with a young child learning to pay attention, plan ahead and remember, and follow lots of rules. Like all of us, kids have to react to things happening in the world around them, while also dealing with worries, temptations, and obligations on their minds. As these demands for attention pile up, air traffic control helps a child regulate the flow of information, prioritize tasks, and above all, find ways to manage stress and avoid mental collisions along the way. Having this ability is a necessity for positive and level mental health. Developing effective air traffic control, overcoming toxic stress, and building solid brain architecture are things kids can't do on their own. And since strong societies are made up of healthy, contributing individuals, it's up to us as a community to make sure all young people have the kinds of nurturing experiences they need for a positive development. To build better futures, we need to build better brains. Okay, so the importance that we hope that you take away from this um, workshop is to understand how stress and trauma can impact our kids. Um, a lot of research is coming out right now about how a, a traumatic brain does not respond to, to traditional behavior modifications. Um, and so as the video showed how much stress and trauma can change the way um, a child's brain functions, 
um, traditional behavior modifications sometimes don't work. So um, again, if we're able to treat everyone as if they have experienced a trauma and use some techniques that we can um, to foster growth and development, um, those behavior modifications tend to work better. Um, but what I'm gonna talk about for the next couple of minutes are some risk factors to consider. Um, again, it's not like a cookie cutter. This is what's gonna happen if you experience this, you're gonna have a significant, um, significant um, defect whenever you are trying to uh, improve or heal from the trauma. But this is just some risk factors to consider. A lot of times we see siblings who have experienced the same traumatic event um, one sibling can uh, respond well to interventions and have better resilience and better success in interventions. And the same sibling who has experienced that same traumatic event could have an opposite effect. So again, these are just some risk factors to consider. Uh, the first is the severity of the event. So these are some questions that we would try to consider. So how serious was the event? How badly was the child or someone she loves physically hurt? Did they or someone they love need to go to the hospital? Were the police involved? Were children separated from their caregivers? Were they interviewed by a principal, police officer, or counselor? Um, and did a friend or family member die? These are, are questions that we take into consideration to understand what that traumatic event was like for that child. Um, again, trauma is different for each of us, we experience it differently. Um, and so again, if we like go back to during Hurricane Katrina and we had a lot of families that were separated, we had a lot of family members um, pass away. Um, this, These are things that we need to look at whenever we're looking at the severity of the trauma for a child. The next is the proximity to the event. So was the child actually at the place where the event occurred? Did they see the event happen to someone else or were they a victim? Did the child watch the event on television? Did they hear a loved one talk about what happened? Um, so when we are working with, um, when we're working with parents of kids who've experienced traumatic events, we talk to them a lot about limiting the media because we are seeing that whenever you're watching the event unfold on the TV over and over again, it is like you're reliving that trauma over and over again. So we try to limit um, media exposure, especially for the kids. And we also talk to the parents about how to talk to their kids about what happened. Um, this is very important because we don't wanna shield the kids or lie to the kids about what has happened, but we also want to be able to explain and, and talk to them according to their de developmental level um, and maturity level. So again, we don't want to um, talk to them about things that they don't understand because then they, that would just increase, um, you know, that stress and anxiety. But we do talk to parents about how you can talk to your kids, uh, especially during COVID. We've seen a lot of information come out about how to talk to your kids about traumatic events and about COVID. Um, so we do encourage parents to do that. If, if you need help, ask for help to assist you in talking to your child. This is a very important one, um, the caregiver's reactions. So did the child's family believe what the child was saying? Did the caregiver take the child's reaction seriously? Um, how did the caregivers respond to the child's needs and how did they cope with the event themselves? So Dr. Bailey and I have, have completed a lot of research on um, the effects of Hurricane Katrina. One of our research studies was um, looking at um, the effects of kids who had relocated to Baton Rouge three to five years after Hurricane Katrina. And so Dr. Bailey took the older kids and we complete, we administered a survey. So Dr. Bailey took the older kids and she looked at what their responses were. And I took the younger kids um, and was looking at their responses that their parents had, um, had, admin, had reported. So if they were under the age of um, second grade, that parent was able to complete the study. And so what we found was that a lot of parents were reporting on their own symptoms. Um, and we know that a lot of times when there's things that are going on at home and the parent is stressed out and the parent is, are experiencing certain things, it does trickle down to the kids. So a caregiver's reaction is very important when you're looking at the risk factors in traumatic events. Prior history of trauma. Um, if you are not familiar with ACEs study, that's the Adverse Childhood Experience uh, study. That is a very important study um, to kind of get some research on because it does talk about traumatic events. 
Um, it goes through a, a list of a questionnaire and you're supposed to answer if this has happened. And then the higher the score, the higher probability that you will have some kind of long-term uh, traumatic stress. But research shows that a child who is continually exposed to traumatic events will have more um, traumatic stress reactions. Family and community factors. Um, we want to look at the culture, race, and ethnicity of the kids and their families because some um, of those uh, ethnicities, race, and cultures have a tight knit community, and that is what is is helped with resilience and with healing of trauma. Um, that could be a very big protective factor, um, and so a lot of that is looking at at those uh, outside resources in the family and the community. Um, but although that culture is very important, uh, we have to take into consideration consideration uh, racism and discrimination because that can also increase the child's um, traumatic stress symptoms. SAMHSA has come out with um, six principles of trauma-informed care. And so all of these are very important. So if you are interested in becoming a trauma-informed teacher, having a trauma-informed classroom, having a trauma-informed school or school district, these are um, the principles that uh, you must abide by in order to be considered trauma-informed. So the first is safety. So a lot of times we focus a lot on a child's physical safety. A lot of schools may have um, where they have the whole school is gated or they may have uh, security cameras and security guards and badges to get through doors and their physical safety is being, um, is, is being addressed, but sometimes their social and emotional safety is not being addressed. But the main thing is to understand what safety means. So safety is different for everybody. Um, and so this is where a very good school climate survey could come into place to where you can find out what you, what your parents and what your teachers and what your kids are thinking, um, do they feel safe at school? Also, um, it's important to, to note that, um, you know, again, safety is, is different for everybody. And this would be a good place to start um, implementing a social and emotional learning curriculum. So SEL is very important here because that can address those social and emotional needs of your students and your, and your teachers and staff. To be trustworthy and transparent, this is also very important because you have to maintain that trust, have that stability and predictability, especially for those kids who've experienced multiple traumatic events. Um, we see a lot of kids are, can be very transient. So if a, a traumatic event happened and they have to leave and go to another family member's home. And so to have that stability and predictability um, is very important. Peer support, a lot of research is, is fostering that peer support. Um, you want to have that student to student relationship um, that, that helps to establish safety and hope and builds trust. Collaboration is also very important. We wanna make sure that everybody is on board from the janitors to the cafeteria workers, to the teachers, to the front office staff and administration. Everybody is on board and we're working collaboratively in order to create a place of healing and a place of safety. Empowerment to making sure that we are um, building upon the strengths and experiences of everyone in the building. Making sure that we are looking at resilience and that we're promoting healing and recovery. And then finally, again, cultural humility. We have to make sure that we are addressing those biases and stereotypes. Uh, we have to make sure that we're going through and we're looking at that and being responsive um, to the needs of everyone, no matter their culture, or their race, their ethnicity, or their gender. We have to make sure that we're doing that and then also recognizing historical trauma. Dr. Bailey. Hello, everyone. Um, so Dr. Conrad went over some general things about the background of trauma and how it can affect the child. Um, for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about how you can make your classroom um, a little bit more trauma informed, um, starting with principles for teachers and um, trauma informed practices. And for a teacher, that all begins with um, behavior management in the classroom. So very early on when you start classes um, in the beginning of the year, that's when behavior management starts. And so you want to make sure those first couple of weeks of school that you lay out clear expectations, that you use that time to build or inform relationships with students, not just 
heard from other teachers about previous students, but really getting to know the students that, that's coming into your classroom. Um, take that time to harness the power of compromise. So it's hard with the power of the play of power in classrooms. Like you're the teacher, it's your classroom, yes, but it's also their classroom, it's their learning environment. And so, um, especially for the older ones, middle school and high school, what are their expectations to include them in that? So always when we worked as school-based therapists, we would come up with um, classroom management um, rules and class, class um, expectations together with teachers and their students. And so have your expectations laid out and what your um, expectations are, but also let the students come up with some expectations. You'll be surprised of how well they've been groomed to know what is expected of them in the classroom. And then they feel like they're part of uh, uh, this, they've agreed to this, they're part of the, of the process of making the rules. And um, actually we've seen this in one of our AWARE schools that, um, for our grant, we're working with, um, a couple of schools and districts with high uh, trauma experiences and the classrooms that did very well are the classrooms that had their students help them come up with their classroom expectations. Now we all know, especially during right now, like using humor, um, sometimes laughing and um, creating an environment that's comfortable to have um, humor in it is, is easy. It helps students become, feel comfortable and making things fun and making things light, especially in the beginning of the year, just because so for some, dealing with what's going on at home or in their um, community and coming to school, they can't shake that. So I don't know if um, a lot of you have seen videos of teachers doing um, different shakes and, and when they're, when they're handshakes when their students are approaching them and coming in in the classroom in the morning, um, doing dances in the middle of the classroom. But this is um, something to make it a little bit more inviting um, instead of just thinking of behavior management as punishment. Um, always allow for redos. Always allow for, you know, if the three strikes and you're out kind of thing. I know we all have different management um, styles, especially when you get to like high school and middle school, like the, um, the red light doesn't really work for them, but always allow, like my rule of thumb, I like to play baseball. So it's three strikes and you're out. You like might need time out for today, but tomorrow's a new day. So don't hold on to, you did this yesterday, you're coming into my classroom and I'm gonna hold against what you did yesterday. Like every day, so you should start fresh. Um, it is very hard to praise a child that's constantly um, doing a negative attention seeking things, but if you can't praise that child, praise other children around them that's doing the socially acceptable thing in your classroom. Instead of focusing on the negative behavior, focus on all the positive things that's going on in the classroom. And I've seen this firsthand where people, like I like how Susie is um, following directions and has her pencil on her table. Like people conform more when they know what's expected of them. And instead of yelling and um, calling out someone who's not doing exactly exactly what you want them to do. It's easier to praise those who are doing what you want to do. And then people will start to look and be like, oh, well then maybe I should do that. Especially when with the younger grades. And the last thing is validate their feelings. Like Dr. Conrad explained earlier, a lot of students are coming in with baggage. Baggage that you may not even see or know about because it's baggage from home and it's um, traumatic experiences or if they saw a fight in the morning on, on the bus or um, if their community had a riot or something, students are coming in with a lot more baggage than they used to. Um, and so I, like, we like to do check-ins and we um, offered this suggestion last year for some um, teachers is to kind of check in and validate people's feelings on where you are. And you could do that and you could uh, Google this too, but you could have like a check-in poster. Some teachers have um, implemented that, do a check-in poster and people anonymous, anonymously are able to like move their clip onto like if from um, a scale of one to 10 on how they're doing today, you know, one being not so great and 10 being like awesome, having a great day. And so the teacher can kind of realize um, whose number it is because it's anonymous and kind of check in with them during the day. So the start of a trauma informed practices in a school begins with you as a teacher, but also moves on to the classroom. Dr. Conrad, you can move the slide. Okay. 
So we talked a little bit about behavior management and it, what goes along with that is you set that precedence in the beginning and kind of come up with rules for the classroom and expectations. But also a little further than that is knowing signs of trauma. And Dr. Conrad kind of introduced to you a little bit um, of background about trauma in children. But, and I believe a lot of schools are gonna now implement some type of school-wide screening, but knowing um, what the signs of trauma are is very important because you know what to look for and you can identify that, you know, Susie came in the beginning of the school year and she was well-dressed and she was always put together. She wasn't tired, but then six weeks in, there's a dramatic change in Susie. So it doesn't automatically mean something's going on, but something can be going on. And we need to probably make a referral to someone so we can get, so we can understand what's going on with Susie. So not that you have to necessarily um, screen a child and ask them all kind of questions, but knowing that something is not quite right with the student and knowing the appropriate referrals and resources in your school will help you identify someone who has experienced tra a traumatic event and may need assistance. Um, there's also the ability that goes with the behavior management, um, pr provide consistent consistency and structure. So once you have those expectations set in the beginning of the school year, you wanna be pretty consistent. And you wanna to try to treat every student as the same, you know, a little, a little different here and there depending on their needs, but being consistent with your um, punishment practices, and I, I don't wanna say punishment, but like um, consequences in your classroom. So if you come up with these with your students, make sure you are consistently doing what you're expecting the students to do and to abide by what the classroom management style is. Um, I don't know how many people have been exposed to social emotional learning training, but it's very important that you understand how social emotional um, aspects of children affect their ability to learn. And it's, um, there's so many trainings out there for you to understand social emotional learning and be, um, benefit you from getting a little bit more training on that. Um, and then we move on to restorative practices and zero tolerance. Um, you always want to try to use restorative practices over, you know, three strikes you're out and there's like no coming back from it. And for those of you who are not familiar with restorative um, consequences and, and practices, it's more of a conversational um, way of, of consequences than um, like you have to get out right now, you can't be in the classroom, like zero tolerance, you're suspended pushing out suspensions and in-school suspensions. And um, so it want, we want to decrease the amount of sending someone to TOR and we want to decrease the amount of suspensions. And so you change the way of how you write students up. So you want to have a conversation with them. You want to ask them like what's happening. You want to engage with them before just sending them to the principal or behavior management. Of course, there's extreme circumstances if the student is you know, irate or combative of course, you're not going to engage in a conversation with them, but you do want to try to pull them to the side and say, "Today, you know, today I noticed that this behavior is going on. It's, it's not behavior I'm, I'm noticing on a um, daily basis. It's something going on." Also, in involving the class um, in on a regular basis on check-ins and things like that. Like I said in the beginning with behavior management, involving the students as much as you can and how your, your classroom is ran helps with trauma-informed um, practices because you make a, a student feel comfortable knowing that if they are having a bad day, if they feel like they might have an outburst, that they can talk to you before even getting in trouble. Um, other things that work well with restorative practices is, um, trying to have conferences with administration and parents before you even suspend the child, not just automatically suspend them and then bring the parent in, but trying to involve the parent first. Um, also behavior contracts and sitting down and saying, I noticed these behaviors, what can we do to make these behaviors better um, and improve your, your performance in the classroom. So it, it does a lot of upfront, let's get together, let's talk about this, instead of just suspending and um, 
and putting them in time out. A lot of these students would rather be at home and not deal with their trauma. And so they will do the first thing because you know, we always do is we're putting them out of class and we're, and we're suspending them. So you want to see students more engaged with restorative practices instead of zero tolerance. I've had enough of you, you have to, you, you have to be suspended. You want to try to engage them and keep them in the school to get them um, to feel like part of the community and that like they really matter. At the end of the day, trust me, I know because I've been homeschooling three children for the last two months. Educating children, especially children from all different backgrounds, um, could be very, very um, difficult and draining and exhausting. So make sure you practice self-care. As social workers, we have supervision and we have people we go to um, to practice self-care and to make sure we're processing things that's going on. I'm not quite sure. Everybody's from different school districts, so I don't know what y'all do um, in your school districts to make sure that you're taking care of yourself. But at the end of the day, to put your best foot forward and to help someone else, you need to make sure you're taking care of yourself. I always use the uh, with my uh, supervisees, I always use the example of the airplane. Like when I first got on the airplane, I could never understand why you told me to put my mask on if anything should happen. I put my oxygen, my oxygen mask on before I help a child or another person. And it wasn't until I was an adult that understood that I can't help someone else if I feel like I'm drowning as well, if I'm not, if I'm not taking care of me. So make sure that you are taking um, care of yourself and engaging in um, self-care. Some things that um, some teachers may do or may not do, but just an overview and just to kind of remind you as a, a little reminder, because I found myself doing this sometimes with my own um, homeschooling, but try to avoid yelling or raising your voice. Um, not, pe not a lot of people aren't yellers, but they might get stern and, and raise their voice, which might trigger something in children, um, especially children who have been abused before. And so that's just making matters a little bit more worse than um, just talking calm, coming down to their level a little bit and um, trying to talk it out. Traditional behavior management systems are not gonna work for um, students who have been exposed to trauma. That positive reinforcement, um, you, wanna, you wanna focus so much more on what they're doing well than what they're not doing well. And so we don't wanna punish them for every little thing that they've done wrong. We wanna start encouraging them from everything they're doing right. So more of positive um, reinforcements than the traditional, you miss, uh, you acted up three times in my class, now you have to go to TOR. Um, how about you got through my class today, so you get a token, you know, and those behavior management systems are definitely going to um, depend on grade level. Uh, it, some um, work better with younger children. Um, it's really hard to implement a behavior, um, positive behavior system in high school, but I've seen it done. Um, but this goes on to knowing to avoid power struggles in a classroom. And some students are combative and uh, argumentative just because of what they've been exposed to. And that's how they interact with um, their home in their home environment. So they bring it to school and think it's okay to interact like that. Um, but just reminding, especially with that beginning, that you know, we're gonna be respectful of everyone. And respect means that I'm not gonna disrespect you in front of the classroom, as I don't expect you to disrespect me in front of the classroom. And so try to avoid when a, when a student becomes combative because they will test you. And those power struggles in front of other classrooms is not always good for other people to see. Um, a lot of people like to take, ooh, a lot of, a lot of teachers, the first thing we do is we take recess away as a consequence. Um, recess is not a privilege. Um, we, they need to be getting out and moving around. It releases dopamine to their brain. It helps them function a little bit better. And so when I say traditional, like, like even when I was a kid, we're not, we did something wrong, they were take, we were staying on the wall for recess. So it's always been a, you know, a consequence but we need to become more innovative in what we think of as consequences. And this is where you can have the class come in at the beginning of the school year and kind of figure out what they think consequences should be. Um, and again, this goes with the be discreet and avoid embarrassment with the power struggles as we talked about earlier. Uh, it is very easy to embarrass or 
shame a student that has been exposed to trauma, depending on their trauma. And so we want to make sure that if we have a problem with a student that we're addressing it on the side and not in front of the entire classroom. Okay, so I'm going to briefly go over an intervention that I use often, um, especially with kids who have severe anxiety. Um, we know that once we um, have a situation, our senses are heightened. So um, especially for anxiety, if you've ever had an anxiety or panic attack, you know that your senses are heightened. So this is called the grounding technique, and this is used to identify um, your senses and to calm your senses down in a state of distress. And so again, like I said, I use this a lot. Um, I even use it myself when I don't like to fly. And so I use this myself when I'm trying to fly, but I also we keep this in our office. So um, if a student is experiencing any distress, they have access to uh, the grounding technique. So the first thing that um, we do is that we think of five things that we can see. So you can use this with the child or the child can do it independently. But the first couple of times I do it with the child and I've had some teachers do it with the whole class the first couple of times, just so everybody knows what they're doing. Um, but you're gonna have the kids come up with five things that they see. So we're using our senses. So what are five things that you see? And as they're identifying those five things, in between, they're taking deep breaths. And deep breaths are always in through your nose and out through your mouth. So we try to teach a lot of uh, deep breathing, belly breathing, and this will help kind of calm the senses down too. So if you can think of five things that you see and take deep breaths in between. So for example, I might say, I see the chalkboard and then I take a deep breath in through my nose, out through my mouth. I see a chair in through my nose, out through my mouth. I see the light switch, breathe in through my nose, out through my mouth. So we're gonna do that until they name five things. Then they're gonna move on to four things that they feel. So this would be, I feel my pants in through your nose, out through your mouth. I can feel my desk in through my nose, out through my mouth. I can feel a pencil. So they name four things, all while they're deep breathing. The third is three things that you hear. I hear the air condition, breathing in through my nose, out through my mouth. I can hear Mr. Thomas cutting the grass outside our classroom, breathing in through our nose, out through our, our mouth. Two things that you smell. So I can smell my crayons. I can smell um, your perfume. I can smell the essential oils in the classroom if that's what's being used. And again, they're breathing in through their nose, out through their mouth. And finally, one thing to taste. Um, sometimes peppermints can cure all. Um, I, I don't know why or what magic peppermints have, but sometimes peppermints will help um, calm kids down and it's a little soothing. So I always keep some in my desk uh, just in case it's needed. So that could be something that they taste. And so once they got to the end and they've, they've done this and they still are kind of on edge, then we go back and we go up. So then we would start again with something different that you taste something different that you smell and we would go through. And so this helps the senses kind of calm down. You're getting all of that out of your head and you're using those senses to identify where you feel um, the most distress. So if your heart is beating really fast, when they get to that touch part, they may say that. They may need something tactile like kinetic sand or a stress ball or a soft blanket to kind of calm them down. So this is something that we've used that, um, that has been very beneficial in the past. So we've talked about um, what you can do as a teacher for behavior management in your classroom, what you could do for your classroom as a teacher, but all of that, you need the support of a school. So one teacher can decide, I'm gonna be trauma-informed, I'm going to make these practices in my classroom, but it's a little bit easier when you have a buy-in from the whole entire school. And so a little bit later, we're going to give you some homework for, um, for the summer, not, you know, something you could do on your own, but the beginning of the year and teacher planning time, which is why this is a great conference because it happens at the end of the year. So you can get ready for the next school year is kind of seeing what you can do differently this next year. And so when you have your meetings with um, the administration and we all are starting to prepare for school and you're having team meetings, these are some of the things that can come up in your meeting. Now, last year in the beginning of the school year, we gave talks to um, a school in Baton Rouge who asked us to come in and kind of get them 
on the right page because the, the school had experienced a lot of trauma itself with um, students dying and teachers dying. And so they thought this was very helpful that we came in the beginning of the school year and we kind of talked about what they wanted to see their school look like so they could be more informed on how to deal with um, traumatic experiences from their students. And so on the, the beginning of the level is the whole school needs to identify a way of assessing traumatic stress. That is not the job of just the teacher, but um, the school counselor and the administrators and teachers need to come together and decide what's gonna be the process of your school on identifying and assessing the traumatic stress that these students might be um, experiencing. As well as the next step is, okay, we're gonna identify it, but what are we gonna do to address the traumatic stress as well? Because once you identify a problem, we need to kind of figure out what are we gonna do to minimize it as a problem. Uh, making sure that, and this is the first step coming to this um, session, is learning and teaching trauma education and awareness, like knowing how trauma affects uh, children and adults as well, because we'll talk about uh, secondary trauma in a minute, um, is very important. So keep um, educating yourself about edu um, trauma education and awareness. It's very important. A lot of information is coming out because of the pandemic that we're currently in. And so it's a lot of good information that's going to be helpful for you to try to implement in the um, school year next year. So looking out for those type of um, educational surveys and educational um, newsletters that's coming out is going to be very important for your future work. Also having partnerships with students and families. Um, a lot of schools have um, open house and that's where these partnerships begin. And so just making sure that you're implementing some of these things when you're first meeting parents and students in open house. Open house is a great way to start um, building your trauma-informed school, getting to know your parents, getting to know where the um, students are coming from and the families that they're involved with. Um, that's when you really can really identify if a student's not really supported by a family member because a family member didn't show up or um, if a student's uh, home life is not ideal because they have um, step parents and blended families and there's a lot of chaos going on in their families. So I think open house is a great way to start building your trauma info, um, information about your next class coming in. Um, but that needs to ha start happening in the beginning of a school year. Creating a trauma informed learning environment. We talked about that with the behavior management and kind of the classroom management styles earlier. But the school also needs to buy into what is the school going to do? And a lot of schools do the positive um, behavior, the PBS, the positive behavior support. And that's one step towards making your or, or creating a trauma informed learning environment, but making sure that the whole school is following whatever your school has decided to do. So if we're supposed to be giving out um, at my school was called pause bucks because we were cougars. If we're, we're supposed to be giving out pause bucks every time we see a um, child following directions or doing something great then we, everybody should be doing that. Everybody should be giving those out all time, not just one teacher versus two teachers versus to nobody, no teachers doing it. Um, Dr. Conrad talks a lot about being culturally responsive, knowing the culture and the students that you're working with is gonna be very important because it's not always the same culture background that you're from. And so understanding how culture plays a role, especially with trauma, because what you consider a trauma, someone else might not consider a trauma. So just being aware and culturally aware of the differences and the similarities between you and your students or students in their environment. You want to integrate emergency management and crisis response. I believe every school has this integrated, um, especially as things continue to happen. And so just reiterating that and going over that in the beginning of the school year and making sure that not only you as a teacher understands the protocol, but the family and the students understand that y'all are prepared for emergency and crisis response. Understanding and addressing staff self-care and secondary tra traumatic stress. So we have suggested um, to a lot of administration that some of your um, workshops throughout the year needs to be geared towards your teacher self-care and addressing secondary traumatic stress, meaning as caregivers, as we care for other people, like probably 90% of the time, some of that stress can start to eat away at us as caregivers and as teachers and as social workers. And so we need to address those symptoms and address those things and have an outlet for you to be able to discuss what you've seen in the classroom, what's going on in the environment. 
And for the schools that are implementing the um, suggestion that we said to do, you know, make sure you have a couple of workshops geared towards uh, self care for your teachers. They're, they are seeing that those have been helping teachers be more open and honest about what's going on in the classroom. Um, you wanna make sure we are evaluating um, and revising school discipline pol policies and practices as needed. And so this is the beginning of the school year. I see a lot of schools do this, is that they wanna, what worked well last year, what didn't work so well, and where should we be going, especially as our environment changes. And just making sure you're collaborating across systems and establishing community partnerships with any um, mental health providers in the, the community, with any um, extracurricular activities in the community. You just wanna make sure you wanna establish um, whatever community your school is in, that y'all have established relationships with any uh, community uh, centers or things like that in the community. Okay, so moving forward, um, this is a multi-phase process for adopting a trauma-sensitive approach. And so the first is that you have to prepare um, to adopt that approach. And so like Dr. Bailey said, this is the perfect time to work with your administration, work with your teachers. We know that y'all are getting together with your districts, trying to figure out what the plan is for next year, whether that be in person or virtual. So now is the time to start thinking about that and preparing for it. Um, but like Dr. Bailey said, we're going to give you a little bit of homework for you to kind of think about later. Um, and in that homework is to envision your trauma sensitive school. If you are able to complete a climate, um, a school climate survey, you're going to understand the needs of your school and you're going to be able to feel like you're going to be able to envision what you want that your school to look like in the trauma sensitive um, approach to align those trauma sensitivities um, approaches with other approaches. So this would be your PBIS, your SEL, your MTSS, all of those things should be aligned as a trauma sensitive or trauma informed approach. Um, and then finally to sustain that trauma sensitivity. So it doesn't just end with, we're gonna go to a PD, we're gonna learn a little bit about trauma sensitivity. Um, we're gonna learn a, bit, a little bit about how to be a trauma informed teacher. And then we're not gonna talk about it again until the end of the school year. This has to be uh, a, something that is sustainable. Um, you're gonna have to understand and learn what are the trauma sensitive triggers of your students. You're gonna have to learn um, and understand what works and what doesn't work. And so it may take a little while to kind of fully get into the swing of things, um, but it's very important to, that if you start it, that you also follow through with it. So like we said, here's a little bit of homework, some things for you to think about. Um, think about the same sub principles that we talked a little bit about, those six, and, and think about some uh, three to four things that you do in your classroom or that your school does uh, that's already in place to make you a trauma sensitive or trauma informed teacher, classroom or school. Um, and this is more, more part for the planning and for your, your vision, but what can you do to assist in moving your school in a trauma informed direction? What can other teachers and what can your administration do? Um, if you are really wanting to uh, become a trauma-informed school, what are some things that need to change in your school uh, to make it trauma-sensitive? Here are some resources that we found that have been very beneficial for teachers. The trauma-informed teacher is really, really helpful. Um, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network is where we got a lot of our information from, especially from SAMHSA as well. Um, and the Treatment and Services Adaption Center, that has been, that's very helpful for resources for teachers and trauma sensitivity. Um, this is another fact uh, sheet for teachers. Um, it goes over this, and again, this is a lot of information and we don't have a whole lot of time, but we did want to put this in here for you um, just so that you could review it at your leisure. Um, we want to thank you for attending. We know it's a Friday afternoon. Um, you know, we also want to thank you so much for all the hard work and dedication you uh, put into taking care of all of the kids in Louisiana. Um, we know it's not an easy job. That's why we teach adults. We don't teach children. Um, but we definitely appreciate everything that you, um, that you do, and we appreciate you coming in. Um, if you don't mind, can you please uh, fill out the evaluation form? Um, and then also here uh, is our contact information. Um, if you have any questions or if you have, you know, anything you want information on, uh, any PDs, you know, please reach out to us and, uh, and let us know. Dr. Conrad, 
Yes. We have a um, couple of requests for the uh, presentation. Okay. Um, is that, is it posted on the teacher summit page or app or anything or do uh, I get information and, and send that to them directly? Um, if you just email it to me, I can get it posted to the Sketch app. Okay, I can do that. Okay, so for you guys that asked about that, oh, I'm sorry, someone's telling me that they can see it in the app. Oh, okay, good, good. Okay, so that means it got posted there. Okay, okay. <laughs> good. So for you guys that were asking for the uh, copies of the slides, they're posted in the Sketch app for this session. And Sketch is where you register to attend this conference. Um, can it be posted on the Teacher Leader Summit page on the DOE site? We have that question in the chat box. I will, um, from what I understand, the answer to that is yes. And I will make it a note of that to make sure it gets done. Any other questions? All right, well, I want to, um, we have a couple comments. Um, someone said they have advocated for trauma-informed practices in schools where I worked. Unfortunately, very few people were interested. Um, mm -hmm. It might help to get a push from higher up. Absolutely. Um, we are actually working on two grants right now, um, Project AWARE and LA SWEX, and um, both of those grants are to improve um, access to mental health services for our kids in Louisiana. And um, the LA SWEX is a new grant that we just received and we're trying to push to have more social workers in schools um, because we know guidance counselors are extremely busy with trying to um, deal with testing and all the other components. And so we would absolutely love it if every school had a social worker that could um, focus mostly on counseling and providing that trauma informed um, you know, education to our teachers because you, let's take Katrina and the flood of 2016, for example, you are experiencing those issues yourselves. You know, a lot of people were displaced, a lot of people um, were flooded, and then you came back to school and had to teach, and you were teaching kids um, while you were experiencing that trauma. And so our hope is that we would be able to have social workers in these schools to provide support to our kids, but to support our teachers as well. And so I 100% agree that if we could get you know, as much money as we possibly could to support the trauma sensitivity and trauma informed practice and PDs for our schools and our, our teachers, I think it would it would trickle down to our kids and we would see a huge improvement in academics as well. Okay, I have a, a question. Well, this is a comment someone made. Professional development at the school-wide level would be beneficial. And then we have a question. For schools that indicate that they are implementing or plan to implement trauma-informed practices, what would be the top indicators that you would look for in their plans? So that would be, um, you could do, a, like, you would want to do assessments um to to kind of see engage where your kids are there's plenty um the sdq we're using that for project aware and so that is an assessment that we would be able to determine um you know the needs of the kids in the schools also school climate um because like we said if we don't have that information of what if your if your your students and your teachers and your parents don't feel safe and they don't feel like they can come to the school as a resource to help them with they what they need to then it's not you know we're not we're not doing our job we're not working to help them um, in that first level of trauma informed care so i would say if you are moving in that direction um, the needs assessment would definitely be something of where to start um, and then as far as professional development um, for your teachers that would be you could do the aces training um, that that's a really good one that is I mean it's very long and so I know that y'all don't have a lot of time 
um, at the beginning of the school year because you have to attend other trainings. But the ACEs training is very important and that has been shown to help with um, trauma-informed care as well. Dr. Bailey, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I believe you said that's right. They need to start with a, um, kind of a school climate survey and um, the school the assessment, deciding how the school is going to assess um, exposure to tra traumatic um, events. Um, a couple of years ago, how we decided on grants um, in the Baton Rouge area was um, by the area code that was affected mostly by the um, the riots and things that were going on in East Baton Rouge. So it just really depends on the parish. It depends on the school district. It depends on if you know. Um, we have other school districts that have lost their own students to violence in the streets. And so they knew that was a big issue. So when you come together and part of your homework is kind of brainstorming, what are some of the issues that you're aware of? So that's where it starts is brainstorming what you're aware of and what you need to be looking for and what you need to be assessing. Dr. Conrad mentioned the SDQ, which is a strengths and difficulty questionnaire. As a teacher, I know you all are familiar with probably Achenbach's child behavior checklist and teacher report form. And you're like, that is too long of a survey for me to be able to implement on every student. So the strengths and difficulties questionnaire is a short survey and it gives you a brief overview as a screen tool. Um, then Achenbach. Achenbach's um, teacher report form is more thorough and in depth and should really be administered to someone who has a higher score on a SDQ than just being that being the first kind of screening tool. So just finding a screening tool that's simple um, and easy to complete because I know your time frame and, and your time is dedicated to educating students. So having just the deciding what assessment is going to help your um, school kind of identify the traumatic experiences that's going on in the environment. And the SDQ is free. The paper version is free as well as the Delaware is a school uh, climate survey and that one's free and it is also um, evidence-based. It's, it's been, there's a lot of research on that, on the Delaware and SDQ. I think you're on mute. Oh my gosh. I sure was. Thank oh. you. <laughs> <laughs> Talking away. I said thank you guys very much. The presentation was very informative and I learned a lot by participating. And we appreciate you guys sharing your knowledge with us. Thank y'all very much. I mean, we can talk all day. So I'm, you know, I appreciate y'all listening and um and thank you for your time. And again, if y'all need anything, please reach out here. You know, our contact information is here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a good weekend.